Well, hello, my friends, and thank you for pressing play, for subscribing to the Stand Up with Pete Dominic, a podcast. It is here every day for you, no matter what I seem to find a way to post almost every day. Rarely do I miss a day, and I'm very excited to have you as a listener. My my volunteer, speaking of listeners, my volunteer announcer, Pete Coe, called in sick today, but that doesn't mean we don't still have an amazing show. We'll have to use a recycled news dump jingle, but we will be okay. Like most days, I have two excellent, very smart, engaging guests and the most robust, informative news recap in all of the podcast world coming your way. Joining me today, Robin Wright, The New Yorker, to talk about her latest analysis regarding Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And I also have a really fascinating conversation with a very interesting guy named Noel Kassler. He's been on the show before. He's a stand-up comedian. He's a commentator. He's a ranter. He is great on Twitter. And he's cultivated a massive following on social media because of his razor-sharp commentary and credibility as someone who worked with the Trump family for years on Celebrity Apprentice and at those awful beauty pageants and more. I think you're going to love both my conversations. Joining me today, Robin Wright, Noel Kassler. It's an award-winning show. And it's also Thursday, if you're listening on Thursday, the, what, 10th of March, which means we hang out tonight. Subscribers can hang out with me. I host a hangout, a happy hour hangout, 8 p.m. East. You get the link if your subscriber should be emailed to you in the morning or when I post the show. I also just wanted to say here at the top that, you know, there are so many amazing people out there in this community of listeners that we've created around this daily podcast. And for that, I I personally am so proud, so fulfilled and purpose driven each day. So many of you have connected and supported each other and made new friends. And it's just freaking the coolest thing in the whole world. And I, I want to recognize listeners for their accomplishments as well as their their struggles, their, your wins and your losses whenever I can. And today I just want to give a shout out to longtime listener Susie Haveman, or is it Haveman, Susie? I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Either way, we've been corresponding for a long time now. She sends great, she and her husband Scott send great vitamin N pictures in. And she emailed me yesterday and it just, just made my day. Susie writes, Pete. I was just asked to run for county council, and when Scott, that's her husband, and I tallied up our pros and cons list, one of our pluses was literally Pete Dominic says we should get involved locally. So we're doing this. I just filed my documents at the county clerk's office today. The primary is June 7th, and I'll link to a story about Susie, and if you're out in Los Alamos, do you want to New Mexico, and you can support her? And her husband uh, for a county council, or if you're a listener and want to support her in any other way, maybe she needs graphics. I don't know. But that's awesome, Susie. I'm so excited that the conversation we have about trying to do things locally has impacted you. It's super inspiring. Congratulations. And I was that just absolutely made my day. All right. Well, that's it. It's time to get to the news. Thank you for all the feedback, by the way, on the news uh, segment with Ava. She joins us again today for good news. I'm trying to get her in as much as I can to do a good news segment at the end of the news dump. But right now it's time for everything that happened yesterday and what we call the last 24. Brought to you by you, folks. You're a subscriber to Stand Up with Pete Dominic. Just go to standupwithpete.com or patreon.com slash Pete Dominic and subscribe now for as little as five bucks a month. Let's go. I sound like Tom Brady on that uh, budget rental car. Is it? But it hurts. Let's go. All right. Before I get started on the news, I, I do want to say, so Pete Coe called in sick yesterday. He, he's a volunteer announcer. He's a voiceover artist. He's trying to make that his, his actual gig, and we all wish him the best, but... He texted me yesterday, yesterday saying he's he's sick. And I said, well, leave me a voicemail about exactly what's going on. And so for the faint of heart that don't like talk of vomit, you might want to fast forward for a minute. But for those of you who have a good sense of humor and love Pete Co., <laughs> this is uh, here is what he left me. Hey, what's up, Pete? Uh, I'm not going to be able to do intro and dump for you for tomorrow's show. I am. Suffering from vertigo, and it's weird. It's like a I feel seasick or something. Mm. It did uh, come with a lot of vomiting. Oh dear! And then I, <laughs> I like threw up my uh, oatmeal from the morning. Oh god! 
you know, the little flakes of oatmeal were in there and then some stomach acid and oh. stuff. And, and then I started dry heaving. Jesus. Only a little bit of acid came out. Good God. That was really weird. So anyway, I'm going to talk to the doctor tomorrow. I think maybe I should not do the intro for tomorrow. Anyway, hope you're well. <laughs> anyway, hope you're well. Love Pete Co. No matter how or what he's talking about, even the grossness of his vertigo. Pete Co. Vertigo. That sounds terrible. Sorry to hear that, buddy. All right, now let's get to the stories out of Putin's invasion into Ukraine. Just a bunch of headlines I want to tell you about. Of course, you probably heard a lot of this already, but Russia bombarding Ukrainian cities while accusing the United States of waging an economic war. Russian forces preventing hundreds of thousands of civilians from escaping. They also destroyed a maternity hospital on Wednesday And the misery now wrought by Russia's Ukraine invasion on February 24th has deepened further in both countries. Destruction and deprivation in Ukraine and the toll of the West's tightening vice grip on Russia's economy. That's how the New York Times is reporting it. The International Monetary Fund approved $1.4 billion in emergency financing support for Ukraine. Companies continue to pull back from Russia. Hyatt and Hilton, the hotel chain, suspending development work there. Sony makes the PlayStation video game console, said it suspended all software and hardware shipments, as well as the operation of the PlayStation store in the country. Little Caesars suspending all operations at Russian stores, which are owned by franchisees, and so much more. The New York Times has a great running list of all the different companies which have pulled out. Canada Goose, H&M, Adidas, American Express, MasterCard, Visa, Citigroup, Deloitte, KPMG, PwC, the big four accounting firms, Ernst & Young as well. The consulting firm Bain, McKinsey & Company, Boston Consulting Group. You probably knew about McDonald's saying they're temporarily closing nearly 850 locations in Russia and halting operations there. Starbucks, Pepsi, Yum Brands is closing company owning uh, KFC restaurants and Pizza Hut restaurants. Netflix, Walt Disney, Sony, Warner Brothers, Amazon now is not accepting new customers for their cloud computing services, and they shut down Prime Video. No Jack Reacher for you, Russia! UPS, FedEx, DHL, Airbus, Boeing, American Airlines, Delta, United's cutting ticket sales partnerships with Russian Airlines. Caterpillar, which makes construction and earth moving equipment, pausing manufacturing in Russia. The point of me reading all this is how much longer can their economy survive? I, I read all these details about it, and it makes me think that it's going to collapse uh, sooner than I've seen experts predicting. So I'm just a bit confused about that and paying close attention to it. Of course, a lot of confusion around these MiG fighter jets. I talked with that with about that with Robin Wright today. But let me now play some of the audio related to the crisis with Putin's invasion into Ukraine. I thought this is a really important story. Yesterday in Washington, D.C., you had a whole bunch of uh, intelligence chiefs appearing before the Intel, Intel Committee, the House Intel Committee, including CIA Director William Burns, who I've never I don't even know if I've seen this guy, much less heard from him. But he said yesterday that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has fallen short of Vladimir Putin's expectations and that he believes the Russian president is likely to escalate military operations. And I thought this is like the whole three minutes from the CIA director yesterday testifying in open House Intelligence Committee testimony was worth it. Here is William Burns three minutes yesterday. And, you know, there was an audience of, of one here to some extent, and that was Vladimir Putin. And take it with a grain of salt. He is the director of the CIA. But here we go. He's gone to war, I think, on the basis, Mr. Chairman, of a number of assumptions which led him to believe that he faced the Russia faced a favorable landscape for the use of force against Ukraine this winter. First, that Ukraine, in his view, was weak and easily intimidated. Second, that the Europeans, especially the French and Germans, were distracted by elections in France and a leadership succession in Germany and risk averse. Third, he believed he had sanctions proofed his economy um, in, in the sense of creating a large war chest of foreign currency reserves. And fourth, he was confident that he had modernized his military and they were capable of a quick, decisive victory at minimal cost. 
Um, he's been proven wrong on every count. Those assumptions have proven to be profoundly flawed over the last 12 days of conflict. President Zelensky, as, as you've mentioned, Mr. Chairman, as the ranking member mentioned, um, has risen to the moment and demonstrated courageous and remarkable leadership, and Ukrainians have resisted fiercely. Um, second, um, the Europeans have demonstrated remarkable resolve, um, especially the Germans. Third, uh, the economic consequences of the sanctions which have been enacted so far are proven to be devastating for Russia, especially against the Russian central bank. Um, in depriving Putin of the ability that he assumed he'd have to defend the ruble. And fourth, his own military's performance has been largely ineffective. Instead of seizing Kiev within the first two days of the campaign, which is what his plan was premised upon, after nearly two weeks, they still have not been able to fully encircle the city. And so, you know, Putin has, has commented privately and publicly over the years that he doesn't believe Ukraine's a real country. He's dead wrong about that. Real countries fight back, and that's what the Ukrainians have done quite heroically over the last 12 days. Um, as you said, Mr. Chairman, I think Putin is angry and frustrated right now. He's likely to double down and try to grind down the Ukrainian military with no regard for civilian casualties. But the challenge that he faces, and this is the biggest question that's hung over our analysis of his planning for months now, as the director, as Director Haynes said, is he has no sustainable political endgame in the face of what is going to continue to be fierce resistance from Ukrainians. So I think that's what his calculus um, has been, and I think the re that's the reality of what he faces today. In terms of casualties, I know um, General Barry may want to comment on that, but there have been far in excess Russian military casualties killed and wounded, far in excess of what he anticipated, because his military planning and assumptions was premised on a quick, decisive victory. Um, and uh, that has not proven to be the case. There you go. Wow. How about that three minutes from the director of the CIA? That's William Burns on Russian President Vladimir Putin. And I, I don't know. I thought that was really interesting. And hopefully you appreciate it, too. Whenever I find these longer clips, I like to share them with you here on the podcast. It's like just so much more contextual in audio form and super helpful to me to hear and always to share. So always send me those things if you see them. All right. Now, here is Evelyn Farkas, who I interviewed on this show when she was running for Congress. She's a former foreign. She's a foreign policy expert. She worked in the Obama administration and before that, rather, uh, in the State Department. And she was a former deputy assistant secretary, also uh, at Department of Defense. And she is definitely an expert, but uh, I think a lot of people disagreeing with much of her analysis of this. Nonetheless, I wanted to give you her perspective. She was on Deadline White House yesterday and was asked, does Putin want war with NATO? Evelyn, you are skilled enough at policy to explain it in a way that I understand it. But what is the likelihood that someone like Vladimir Putin, who seems to be itching for a phony pretext to escalate, would, would understand and appreciate those nuances? Well, I think that his generals would explain it to him in language that he would understand because his generals should understand what that means. I guess you your question, though, does raise the question, which is, you know, how far will Vladimir Putin go? Does he want war with NATO? And I have been of the mindset that he doesn't want war with NATO. But it is true if he feels like he's not prevailing he, he could potentially expand the war. And certainly that would be a rationale that would resonate with his people. But I don't think militarily speaking, that's in his interest. I don't think his generals would want that. And in 2015, when Turkey shot down a Russian aircraft because it had strayed into Turkish airspace and did not heed the warnings of the Turkish um, Air Force, the Russians did not retaliate with force. So we've seen instances where they don't counterattack. Again, I know there's a lot of risk. But I think the ultimate argument that I'm trying to make, as well as my colleagues who signed this open letter, is to say, don't take anything off the table and please yeah. don't tell Vladimir Putin what we want to do. Yes, that's Evelyn Farkas, who signed this open letter with a whole bunch of other military folks, State Department folks, ex, of course, uh, saying that there should be maybe some kind of a partial no fly zone. And there's more news yesterday that this is coming from the White House. Warnings from the White House. Jen Psaki herself tweeting that Russia might use chemical weapons. 
She actually took to her very popular Twitter account yesterday, the president's spokeswoman, and tweeted a bit of a thread. She wrote, we took note of Russia's false claims about alleged U.S. biological weapons labs and chemical weapons development in Ukraine. We've also seen Chinese officials echo these conspiracy theories. This is all an obvious ploy by Russia to try to justify its further premeditated, unprovoked and unjustified attack on Ukraine. Now that Russia has made these false claims and China has seemingly endorsed this propaganda, we should all be on the lookout for Russia to possibly use chemical or biological weapons in Ukraine or to create a false flag operation using them. It's a clear pattern. So look for that unfortunate, horrible detail. Uh, Wolf Blitzer had the mayor of a Ukrainian city named Michael Live, I think. It's Alexander Senkovich. And Wolf Blitzer on CNN yesterday asked him uh, about the idea that Russia could use chemical weapons on the ground in his city. I won't be surprised in that case. Actually, our city was bombed for three last days with the cluster bombs, which are actually illegal. So, and the aim of these bombs is uh, human. Uh, I mean, humanity, not the machines or something like buildings, but uh, all everything that is alive. So uh, they use cluster bombs to kill our people. I won't be surprised if they use chemical and, and etc. Crazy. All right, let me go now to Congressman Adam Schiff, who was on CNN talking to Jake Tapper about the line that the United States has to walk in providing support for Ukraine. And he also asked him about that chemical weapon threat. Does the U.S. know for sure that Russia is responsible for this horrific attack on that hospital, that maternity and children's hospital in Mariupol? Um, Jake, I haven't gotten a report yet uh, from the intelligence community about it. Uh, I'm getting briefed uh, generally multiple times a day, but I don't have fidelity on that. Uh, of course, the Russians are increasingly indiscriminate in their bombing. Uh, it is, as sadly uh, we anticipated, uh, the stiff resistance the Russians are meeting uh, is causing Putin to simply double down uh, and try to inflict as much pain as possible. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't have confirmation, but uh, it's certainly tragically consistent with what we're seeing of uh, how the Russians are broadening this conflict and uh, just trying to inflict uh, maximum pain uh, on the people of Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, it certainly wouldn't be out of character. They've already bombed several hospitals in Ukraine, and, and they did so to a devastating effect in, in Syria over the past decade. Um, just moments ago, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki tweeted, quote, we should all be on the lookout for Russia to possibly use chemical or biological weapons in Ukraine or to create a false flag operation using them, unquote. Do you expect that to happen? Uh, You know, this is uh, sadly one of the false flag operations that uh, we anticipate the Russians may deploy. Um, This is part of their trade craft. uh, And, you know, sadly, we've seen uh, similar things in the past. Uh, So I am deeply concerned about it. Uh, And of course, depending on how the Russians go about it, uh, if they were to use chemical or biological uh, agents as a pretext, uh, of course, um, that would be another terrible escalation. uh, And who knows where that could lead. All right. That is a very uh, important warning from Adam Schiff and all this talk of chemical weapons that, yeah, they use them in Syria. What is going to stop them from using them in in Putin, from using them in, in Ukraine as well? All right. Let's head into the press briefing room where White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki got into it again with Fox News White House correspondent Peter Ducey over gas prices for the second time this week. And it was only Wednesday when this happened. And it's just always crazy to me because it always sounds to me like a real mismatch where he is just taking swing after swing, miss after miss, and she is just pounding him in the ground with sound arguments and information. But maybe that, I mean, honestly, maybe that's my bias. Maybe he's asking good questions and I just don't hear it because I dislike him so much. Uh, Nonetheless, here it is. You and the president are both talking about producing energy here, saying that oil and gas companies have 9,000 permits to drill now. They could be drilling right now. Would President Biden cut red tape to make that possible? What red tape needs to be cut when they have the permits, uh, they have the capacity to do it. 
What's holding does, them up? Does President Biden think that each of these 9,000 leases that are available have oil or gas in them? Because industry experts are saying that uh, that accusation is, is a complete red herring. Some permits are viable and some are not. And that when you say that, this represents a fundamental misunderstanding as to how this process works. Well, first of all, the nearly 60 percent of leased acres remain non-producing. That's a lot uh, in the range of 20 million acres. So there are 9,000 uh, unused approved permits to drill in. They should not require that should not require us inviting them to do that. They should do well, that themselves. The, the additional permits. So would the president? What additional permits do they need? There's no. The, they have the leases are there. The permits are there. I don't think they need an embroidered invitation to drill. That is, they are oil companies. It's what is what is happening? What is happening? But look, what is ha the permits have been granted, Peter? What is permit, what is happening mm -hmm. here? is that we are seeing these are private sector companies. We recognize that. Many of them are making record profits. We see that. That is all publicly available data. They have pressure to return cash to investors and their shareholders. What we're saying right now is there is a war. We're asking them to, to uh, go uh, use the, the approved permits, use the unused space, and go uh, get more supply out of the ground in our own country. Okay, and then just... All right, there you go. Peter Ducey getting just slammed by Jen Psaki, in my opinion. And, of course, yeah, she nails it about well, the, the record profits and the returns they're, they're sending to their sh shareholders and so on. And then the argument is there's ar they already have the permits. The, the oil is in the ground. They can take it out if they want. It's up to them to get it done. Well, here's a better idea. Nearly 200 groups have now called on environmental justice groups have called on the Biden administration to use the Defense Production Act to ramp up the deployment of renewable energy to transition the world off of fossil fuels. Go to stand.earth to see this letter that these 200 organizations have sent to President Biden. But they write in part, we urge you to utilize the Defense Production Act to ramp up the deployment of renewable energy to transition the world off fossil fuels and generate millions of good quality union jobs. The De Defense Production Act, which you have already used to fight COVID-19 pandemic and respond to wildfires, provides you with the historic opportunity to produce alternatives to fossil fuels, fight the climate emergency, combat Putin's stranglehold in the world's energy economy, and support the transition to a renewable and just economy. While we call for the use of the DPA, we implore that you use this mechanism for peaceful means, not increased militarization of the conflict. And then they went on to detail what they want him to do with the with him invoking DPA powers, rapidly scale up production, manufacturing, deployment of renewable energy technologies, heat pumps, storage and weatherization technologies here and abroad, create millions of long term, high paying domestic jobs, accelerate the transition to zero emission public transportation alternatives to car based transportation and related infrastructure domestically and so much more. 200 organizations signed it. Stand.Earth, Bill McKibben behind it, uh, supporting it on social media and so many others. So I highly recommend you look at that as an alternative and something to invest some kind of uh, hope in. Is this a tipping point moment? Kevin Gorman tweets at Storman1121. Love, Stev, uh, Storman, Kevin Gorman. Hey, Kev, hope you're good. We got to talk. Oh, I, I thought this was funny. I like this guy, Brent Terhoon. He's one of these comedians who's gotten really big on social media, on YouTube and so on. And he's also on Bob and Tom's uh, popular radio show. Anyway, he does this kind of rednecky character and makes videos. And this is uh, one about gas prices, which I thought was was funny and wanted to watch and share with you. His message goes out to our Brandon in chief. You know, these gas prices are high as hell and I'm tired of it. You need to do your job. That's what you need to do. Hell, everybody else is. Congress makes the laws. The courts interpret the laws. And the president controls the gas prices. Everybody knows that. You took an oath. That's what you did. You stood up there and you took an oath to make sure us Americans don't have to pay $170 every time we fill up our trucks. And you're blowing it. I, I What's the average working man supposed to do, huh? Stop driving a 7,000-pound vehicle, even though he doesn't do any truck stuff with it, and I work <laughs> from home? I don't think so. 
that next they're going to tell me to take all the flags and the bumper stickers off to reduce the drag. I don't think so, Brando. <laughs> my heart goes out to all the working men out there. I'm raising my emotional support beer to you for putting up with all this tyranny. Lower the gas prices. We might have to set up a little gas convoy to show you we mean business about all these gas prices. <laughs> <laughs> That's comedian Brent Turhune, and uh, very funny guy. I, I like that stuff. Well, you know how Republican congressmen keep going to white supremacist, white nationalist gatherings and meetings and doing all kinds of white nationalist things because so many of them are white nationalists? Well, uh, the leader of the Republicans in the House is Kevin McCarthy. And is he really the leader or is Marjorie Taylor Greene the leader? Anyway, he was asked yesterday if if he talked to her about maybe maybe not attending any more white nationalist conferences. And he basically dodges. He's like, yep, we, I had a talk with her. And then uh, CNN's uh, Manu Raju follows up. I hope you can hear this. I know there was an issue with hearing the reporter question in a clip I played yesterday uh, that sounded like dead air. I'm sorry about that. But I think you should be able to hear this. Any update on your conversations with uh, Congressman Dosar and Green? Yes, I talked to Green. I still haven't talked to him. And I talked to him. But you said I think you told Jake and Manu that there's no place for There is no place for that. There's no place for what has gone on with that organization by far. And there never will be in this party, and it'll never be totally. And will she go again? Yes. Do you know she will not go again? Will she get any repercussions for her? Uh Look, at my, my conversations with my members are exactly that. And uh, I appreciate you asking. All right. So sorry, not great audio. But the bottom line is, yeah, there's no repercussions, no consequences for going to white nationalist meetings. He says she's not going to go anymore, but she obviously doesn't answer to him. I think it's uh, the other way around. But an important follow up question and issue, obviously. So I wanted to give that to you. All right, well, that's all the audio I've got for you from yesterday, but I do have a whole bunch more headlines in what we call the news dump. Now, let's reach back for an archive news dump jingle from Pete Coe. Go back to a, an old classic, shall we? Ah, uh, yes, Brown Bear taking a crap in your pool. Brown Bear Visitor takes a great big dump. It's floating in your pool on today's news dump. <laughs> First growl was just a growl, but that second growl sounded like maybe he was pushing out his bear crap. All right, folks. Well, I've got a lot of stories for you in today's news dump and looking forward to another good news story from my daughter Ava wrapping it up today. Is this a good or bad news story? I don't know. Trump's plane made an emergency landing after the uh, GOP retreat, and then I guess he put out a fundraiser for asking people for money for a new plane or something. Anyway, a private plane carrying President Trump in an emergency landing Saturday after one of its engines failed shortly after his appearance at a uh, RNC-hosted donor retreat in New Orleans, according to a number of news outlets. The plane was in the air for like 20 or 30 minutes before one of the engines failed all uh, over the Gulf of Mexico, and luckily they landed safely. Private plane had Secret Service agents on board, along with other support staff and Trump advisors. And soon after the emergency landing, the the RNC found the former president another plane that belonged to a donor for the evening, and eventually landed in Palm Beach around 3 a.m. So he's he's home safe. Phew. That must have been a real scare for people, right? Mm. All right. Well, moving on. The CEO of Disney is now saying he opposes the Florida Don't Say Gay Bill, it's, as it's being called by its critics and gay people, and people who care about gay people. And he's going to meet with the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis. I talked with Michelangelo Signorelli about this. We'll get that on tomorrow's episode of Stand Up. Really important issue underway out uh, down in Florida. But yeah, the CEO of uh, Walt Disney Company, Bob Chappick, said he opposes the Don't Say Gay bill, which limits discussions in schools about LGBTQ plus identities. And so that's a reversal, of course, uh, on his uh, previously neutral position, but faced quite an immense backlash. And now he's walking it back. All right, Stacey Abrams is qualified for her run for governor of Georgia, which will be her second shot at it. Arguably, she won the first time 
some people, including she thinks. But Fox News poll conducted earlier this month, month found that the, the current governor, incumbent Brian Kemp, had an 11-point lead over his opponent, George, uh, David Perdue. So he's in a fierce primary race. And she officially launched her campaign uh, for governor back in, in December. But now she is uh, officially qualified for her bid for governor of Georgia. So pay attention down there and support her if you can. Here's a headline you might like or might not. Party like it's 2019. Florida and Fort Lauderdale are expecting triple the amount of visitors over the last year as tens of thousands prepare to celebrate the first spring break in the U.S. free of COVID rules. Not free of COVID, though. Here, that's the thing. So a lot of them are probably going to get covid in a lot of popular vacation spots like Fort Lauderdale. What do my Florida friends and listeners think about that? Now, I don't think I would normally report on a story or just a, a, like that somebody said a thing, but I, I did like this. The Facebook meta COO Cheryl Sandberg apparently said that no two countries run by women would ever go to war her comments coming amid the Russian invasion of Ukraine. She also said she believes that if half the world were run by women, it would be, quote, safer and much more prosperous, according to CNBC. She was speaking to CNN, uh, CNBC's Hadley Gamble on International Women's Day. She said there's a complete crisis for gender equality. And anyway, I, I thought that that was all good. I should have found the audio for that, but I just saw this story and wanted to mention it. Should mention that Iowa's governor, uh, Kim Reynolds, has decided she's going to uh, run for re-election in Iowa. She'll be facing the likely Democratic nominee, Deirdre DeGere, who's a small business owner, and uh, our friend Mark Nolte, longtime listener, who was thinking about running for governor himself. He's a big deal in Iowa. Just told me about her, so maybe we can get her on the show, see what she thinks and what her plans for Iowa are. A lot of listeners in Iowa. Hi, Kim. And you know who else is in Iowa right now? Ty. Ty usually lives in Maryland, but he's actually on a business in Iowa right now. So a lot of folks live in Iowa. Sorry if I left you out. But now it's time to go to our final story, which I'm trying to make a good news story as broadcasted, hosted by my daughter, Ava. We'll try to get Julia worked into the mix as well. But hey, Ava, what have you got for us? Hey, Dad. Yesterday's good news was the resurgence of the humpback whales in Australia. And today we are saving sea cows in Florida. Yay, sea cows. (laughs) More than 55 tons of lettuce have been fed to starving Florida manatees as part of an experimental program to help the marine mammals since their natural food is being destroyed by water pollution. The lettuce, funded by more than 1,000 generous individual donations, is offered to manatees that gather in the warm water discharge near a power plant on Florida's east coast, as they typically do during cold months. These the sea cows, they gather near a power plant's warm water. Okay. All right. Sounds fun. <laughs> the unprecedented feeding response came after a record of 1,100 manatees died last year, largely because of starvation. The problem requires a long-term solution because pollution from agriculture, septic tanks, urban runoff, and other sources is killing the seagrass on which the ma- marine mammals rely. So even though they do a lot of bad things... Florida legislators last year provided $8 million for several seagrass restoration projects that will get off the ground this year, officials said. There are currently about 7,500 manatees, also known as sea cows, sea cows, <laughs> living in Florida waters. They are listed federally as a threatened species, although there are efforts to give them the heightened endangered designation. Unfortunately, the sea cows will not be allowed to say gay. Wah, wah. And that's today's good news. Glad to be back. Back to you, Dad. Thanks, Ava. All right, there she goes. But by the way, I gave her that joke. That was my joke. I don't want you to think that that was her joke. The manatee, don't say gay. I told her to say that. And then I want want it even worse. So I like gave her the joke and kind of booed it. That was pretty bad. That's pretty bad. <laughs> Did I just ruin the good news story? All right, so now it's time to get to my guests. I do want to thank my sponsor this week, though, Indeed.com, folks. If you are hiring, you need Indeed. Go to Indeed.com slash stand up. Right now, you get a $75 credit 
to sponsor your first job posting so you get better visibility, you get more applications and quicker hiring time. So if you're looking to hire somebody, no matter what you do, no matter what kind of firm you work for, go to Indeed.com slash stand up, support yourself, your place of employment and the show at the same time. Indeed.com slash stand up. Thanks for supporting us on the program this week. Okay, well, I've talked to my first guest. I should say Robin Wright. I brought, I put on uh, after my first guest. I talked to Robin Wright for about 15, 20 minutes yesterday. I called her and she fit me in between all of her big interviews. She's working at uh, really important think tanks. She, of course, writes for The New Yorker. She's an author. Great conversation with Robin on the phone yesterday. But first, I got to play Noel Kassler. Uh, people uh, love this guy. He's got like almost 400,000 followers on Twitter. Kasler Noel, at Kasler Noel, is that Twitter handle where he is very, very popular. And so that's what he's like best known for, his Twitter commentary and all the truth that he unveils he, uh, on there and everywhere else that he appears. He does these hilarious rants in his car. He's got like 25 years of experience behind the scenes in live television and, and music. He spent six seasons working directly with the Trump family on Celebrity and Prentice. He also toured with all kinds of musicians like Springsteen, The Stones, Crosby, Stills, Nash, Madonna, and so many more. And his career is basically informed and, and guided his work, as well as his stand-up comedy, giving him this really interesting, unique perspective because of all his first-hand experiences. But he also does his research. He really does read some great journalism and books about the issues, and he's just so good at talking. You'll notice he doesn't like stop with ums and ands. He just has a great cadence. I just love talking to Noel. We had an awesome conversation yesterday about all kinds of things. And uh, we also even talked about doing some dates together because we really did hit it off. Check him out at noelkasler.com. Uh, I start with making fun of his hair. He's got this this beard. He's a really good looking guy. And he's got this hair. It looks like he does all kinds of weird highlights in it. But apparently it's natural. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Noel Kasler back on the show for the first time, second time, I should say. And uh, hopefully not the last time because I'd love to make this guy a regular. Here we go. Great to see you, man. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm a huge fan of, of, of everything you do. I love your Twitter feed. I love your car rants. I love your podcast. I'm a big Noel Kastler fan. I would like, if you sold merch, I might, I think I might buy it. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome, Pete. Thanks for having me back, man. You're, you're an idol of mine. You've been doing this, you know, for a long time and you're the real deal. So thanks for having That's, me. You know, it's the other, one of the other reasons I love you is because you put me in proper context uh, <laughs> and with tremendous integrity. But I do just... You know, when the first time we talked, I want to get into all kinds of stuff. I want to get your take on everything. Like, we didn't talk about your hair at all. And I thought maybe you should tell the world, and this is the clip that I'll release to, you know, and you can say however you want. What, what is it with, with your, your face, especially your hair? Right. This is the real deal. God is my colorist. This is my birthmark. It's been there my whole life. So I sort of grow it out in this 70s Jackson Brown thing to accentuate the birthmark, you know, and then I have the bl the beard is black hair. None of this is dyed. As I said, this is all natural. You're telling me there's no coloring in any of your hair. That's not, you're just like you just were born looking like a pudding pop. Exactly. Exactly. I came out this way. This is pretty much what I looked like as an infant. You know, don't you think that that look that a lot of people could only find, first of all, have you ever been asked to model uh, like on a, on a hair dye box or something? No, but here's the other thing. My hair is also super soft, like a baby's hair. Yeah. Touch it. <laughs> it's, I, I, this is one, another thing I'll say, like for those of people listening, I'll release video, but our, the juxtaposition between you and I is, is jarring. You look like, the after picture of some kind of hair product. And I look like a uh, Gollum from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's, That's hilarious, dude. You know, I've had this hair obviously forever. I'm 51 in two weeks. And like, you know, so we're around the same age. And I went to high school in the eighties in Northern Westchester. And I would wear this like flock of seagulls. Like it would just be the long thing in front and then shaved on the sides yeah. and stuff. Was right. So great. Don't you think last question, but don't you think it's given you certain advantages? Like, I think that you're brilliant on Twitter and I, I love your stuff. All the things that you say I love, but your face 
is really something, and I'm sure it hasn't hurt you. I'm sure it helped you in your career and in your life. Yes? Yeah. It's a curse and a burden. You know yeah. how it is. I don't. <laughs> I don't. That's why I'm asking you these legitimate <laughs> yeah. questions. Of course it does. You know, you get away with stuff. You know, it's funny you say that. When I was a tour manager, you deal with a lot of pissed off people in hotels and stuff. And when I would wear glasses, the world would react to me different. Oh, with glasses so. on, I was just kind of an asshole, giving them a hard time that the rooms weren't ready. If I didn't have glasses on, it's sort of friendlier and a cuter look. And you get, you know, you get more flies with honey. And I literally would like take my glasses off and leave them on the tour bus when I had to go like, you know, bitch out a hotel person or something. That's I guess I can kind of relate to the, it's like when during COVID, when wearing a mask, people will look at me in a hat. If I wear a mask and a hat, people are like, wow, he's a pretty good looking guy. But when I take off my hat and mask, they're like, oh, not not as much when you see most of it of his head. I feel like that's I, that's how I relate to what you just said. <laughs> You're a great looking guy, Pete. No, I'm a beautiful man. So let's let's talk about the world uh, that we're in. There's so much that that you can you can speak to. But I get I, I think the thing that really made me want to talk to you was you were one of the only people, not that this is like the most original thing, but I think it's a really important thing to point out, kind of like that I saw that was saying, oh, glad, good thing America doesn't have oligarchs. So as the world learns about the Russian oligarchy and how it influences their leaders, Putin and, and their government, you've been kind of saying, hey, uh, can we talk about our front yard, our backyard? So Give me give me some of that sauce and why, you know, why, why you're doing that, and what you're seeing, what you what you wish people would think about when they're seeing what's happening in Russia. Well, you have to think about the undue influence that wealth has in this country. You know, billionaires are running running the game in, in many ways. And, you know, you're referring to a tweet I wrote the other day. I was just walking down Fifth Avenue and I'm like, oh, look, there's the Coke Center, you know, at, at the Met. There's the Sackler Wing, you know, or the Sackler Wing. They took away the name, but they're still funding the Guggenheim Theater and stuff. And the Koch brothers themselves, their father made his fortune by basically cracking crude oil for Stalin. The oil that they have in Russia is naturally really shitty kind of oil and you need to crack it, which is this chemical process of breaking it down to refine it and sell it, right? Make it usable. That was a technique that the Koch brothers' father basically mastered in, in Stalin era Soviet Union and then brought it to the U.S. And then they had an undue influence on politics since the late 70s, because in the late 70s, Jimmy Carter was like, hey, we got to go with renewable energy. We got to put solar powers on the White House. And that happened to be that the same time that all these sort of energy oligarchs and companies started funding these right wing groups, the Heritage, Found Heritage Foundation, yeah. you know, they got scared of that progressive sort of energy thing. And they sort of started manipulating the conservative base with all this right wing demagoguery, right? The anti-abortion, the gay rights, all these horrible things are going to happen to the country. And then it also, you know, it culminated with Citizens United, as you know, you know, when Mitch McConnell and the Supreme Court sort of decided like money's no object anymore in politics and you can throw as much money at a candidate as you want. Yep. That just tipped the scales in the, in the favor of the oligarchs and we see where it's at now. You yeah. Know? And I think that it's such a good point to point you know, Everybody knows that most of that money from Russia comes from oil. And you're pointing to the oil billionaires in America. Certainly, we could talk about the billionaires uh, in, in, from finance uh, and other industries, uh, every industry, you know, the healthcare industry, you name it. There's going to be super wealthy people that are donating the campaigns that are doing what you just said. But the most important, seemingly damaging industry is the fossil fuel industry. So whether it's Russia or America, they're having a huge influence on policy and including foreign policy, which is why we get into these wars. So it's such a, a good point to talk about those oligarchs. Anything else you want to say before I get to yeah. about oligar American oligarchy? Yeah, well, I want to make another point on that because th these guys are like oligarchs. There's a guy named Kelsey Warren. He owns a huge fracking energy company in Texas. He has an outsized influence with Governor Abbott. He got like he's the guy who got the legislation that made it basically illegal to question any fracking operations within your municip municipality in Texas. Right. So this guy, Kelsey Warren, was also the guy behind the DAPL pipeline. 
You remember in South Dakota, the big protest that happened a few years ago, that was this guy's project. Now, this guy also was a music fan, right? And he would have his own music festival every year in Texas. And I did it once. And it was like Jackson Brown, Don Henley, like all these big names. And we'd go and play on this guy's ranch. And there'd be like 250 people there. Like he literally had a private life. Yeah, yeah. You know, a like lot, it should be mentioned. It should be mentioned. You can speak to this more than I can, but I can speak to a bit just based on my career. A lot of wealthy people hire the biggest names in music, in comedy or mostly in music uh, to do private concerts. It's not it's not uh, uncommon. I mean, even like, you know, parties for their kids, bar mitzvahs and stuff I've heard of. But nonetheless, go back to this guy and, and that party. Well, we didn't know who this guy was like. So he flies us in. We're staying in you know, Austin. They put us they send a limo or whatever. You go out to this guy's ranch and it's 100,000 acres, you know, and there's 250 of his wealthy friends. there, literally like Don Henley, you know, A-list entertainers. And we're like, how does this guy make his money? And then we learned that it was this energy company guy. And this ranch we were on was like 100,000 acres or 70,000, like something ridiculous. And they were like, this is one of four ranches that this guy has in Texas alone, you know? So my point is when you see the amount of wealth these guys have, they all get good at sort of laundering that cultural currency by like, look, I'm having a music festival. I'm funding a museum. You know, they buy their way into the good graces. The Sacklers, you know, were destroying this country with opioids and also giving tons of money to, you know, to charities. And that buys a certain cover that we can't accept anymore because that's how you end up in these messes. You know? What do you think about the progressive billionaires who donate to progressive causes? You know, people always go after people like uh, George Soros. I mean, I mean, you could say Bill Gates, you could say Bezos, you could say so many that generally will donate to a wide range of things. But like when it comes to certain, it, it, I think it matters. First of all, they shouldn't be able to do that. There should be a law right. against that. Obviously, because they they're all kingmakers. It should be they get taxed and then we the people decide what initiatives we want to spend that money on. But nonetheless, that's the system we have set up. But what do you think of the kind of progressive billionaires who obviously they're often advocating against their own interests and sometimes they certainly aren't? Yeah, you know, it, that's a d difficult situation because we certainly need the money for charity. But. You know, I probably come down on the side of like nobody makes that much money without hurting anybody. <laughs> you know, like even the good billionaires, it's kind of it's just so imbalanced. I live in a town of horse farms and like six or seven billionaires. Bloomberg lives here. Wow. Bill Gates, his daughter has a house here. She got married here this summer and they flew in Coldplay to play the wedding. You know, and they built like a temporary structure to have this wedding in that was like a permanent building. So just the outsized consumption of resources that these billionaires consume seems to tip the scales, not in the favor of sort of equanimity. You know, you go out to the Hamptons and stuff like why does somebody need a 14 room, 60,000 square foot house at the beach? So I guess my answer would be. Like if you're giving your money away as a billionaire, fine. But if you're using more than your fair share of energy and resource just because you can, then you need to check yourself. You well, know? I mean, they should if you're I say if you're a billionaire and you're advocating for strict campaign finance laws, public financing of campaigns, if you're advocating for less money in politics, that's a good thing. But I, I don't know if there's any good billionaires. And where do you live? Like in, in, in Chelsea Clinton's guest house or? It's a beautiful. Yeah, pretty much. You know, I'm in, in northern Westchester, a little horse town on the Connecticut border. But yeah, no, you know, I have the same argument with my girlfriend every summer. We go to Nantucket and there's all these oh, we like. Do too. We do, too. We have. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no. So, you know that. So we go there and she's been going there her whole life. She comes from money. I don't necessarily or at all. <laughs> but uh, I walk around the harbor and in the last 10 years you see these super yachts these same kind of oh, yachts yeah. that they're confiscating and i'm i always tell her i'm like you don't make that much money without hurting somebody like you just don't get a no, boat there's no car. there's we there's there's i only i have a hard time entertaining any conversation otherwise or any argument otherwise but you know i did i did the nantucket comedy festival and they were like cheap and they would have a family host you and the family that hosted me was they were like you know she's a real estate agent and so she was right. certainly and she doesn't make uh, millions of dollars, but so she has a little tiny house there and we fell in love with the place. But you're absolutely right. The money on that island alone 
is insane. They, I mean, tons of American oligarchs there. But let's shift back to what's happening now in Russia. You have some really fascinating, fascinating things to say about the Trump family and their involvement in Russia. It's really worth listening to your 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 podcast, your car rants, and obviously reading your Twitter feed. But just remind people like how you got involved with that family in case they're not already big fans and supporters of yours. How did you know the Trumps? Where did you, you first met him on Celebrity Apprentice? Uh, I did the, the in the 90s. I did the uh, the pageants. You know, I was like a PA talent wrangler and a friend of mine was a production coordinator on the uh, Miss Universe, you know, pageants and contestants. And we do these one off events around New York City. And then, yeah, I got hired as a talent man wrangler, essentially on Celebrity Apprentice, which, you know, you're a veteran of the Apprentice stuff. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I, I dealt with him and saw a bunch of the peccadilloes behind the scenes, so to speak. But you know, one of the interesting things of that time was backstage would be all these Russians. You know, it'd be Felix Sater making introductions between Ivanka and Jared to all these oligarch types that would be at the after parties. And, you know, the type like these dudes would come with like a 23 year old girlfriend in a mink coat, you know, in June, you know, and it'd be like some 60 year old, like scary looking Russian dude. And they'd be like work in the room. And People may not remember, but in the 80s, you know, when he opened Trump Tower in 83 in New York City before that, everything was kind of a co-op based thing. If you had money and wanted to buy into New York, you had to go to the right schools. You had to know the right people. You had to go before a co-op board. And basically, Trump, you know, he didn't invent the concept of condos, but he invented the concept of like high end condos that I don't care where you got the money. And that happened to coincide with the fall of the Soviet Union and a lot of corruption and a lot of people trying to get their money out of the former Soviet Union. And Trump was all too happy to take it. So we essentially established a large scale Russian money laundering operation 30 years ago in this country. And, you know, we paid the price for that in all his policy choices that were just obvious if you were paying attention in the last five years, you know. You were around these guys like you you met Felix Sater. You saw him. Yeah. yeah, I was in the room with him, dude, at Trump Soho, which was already like a completely sketchy building, you know, that they had all this weird funding in that was coming out of, you know, Eastern Europe and stuff. And Cy Vance was going to had a case and, and he was basically talked out of it. But no, I was in the room at Trump Soho it was probably the summer of 2010. It was like June. And I just remember this after party. And I remember like I didn't hadn't connected all the dots. Right. Nobody even knew he was running for president at this point. It was just super sketchy to be there. And, and if your viewers don't know, Felix Sater's the Russian guy who like, you know, he stabbed somebody's eye out with a cocktail glass in a bar. You know, <laughs> he's like a real hard ass Russian oligarch or not oligarch. Uh, kind of mobster, right? for lack of a better term, you know, friend to the oligarchs, friend to the corrupt. He's a handler. He's a cutout. He's a player. Right. He's, yeah. And, right. And he had at the time Trump organization business cards. I literally saw his business card because he gave it to my colleague because I remember asking, like, who's that guy? Because I didn't know him by name. Yeah. I just knew he was obviously close with the Trump family. And that's your job is to sit in the room and know who the hell everybody is walking around. And they're like, dude, that guy's Felix Sater. Look, he gave me his card. And it was Trump organization business card. And, you know, that should have been the end of Trump's career. Just the associations there alone, the stuff that Michael Cohen admitted to, you know, building Trump Tower in 2016 and lying about it, you know, pretending to, you know, that it was a done project. Uh, the, 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 you mean the deal to build the Trump right. Tower in right. Moscow? Is that what you're talking about? Exactly. It never happened, but they were still pursuing that at the same time the dude was running for president. Yeah. Like if ever there's a red flag, that's it. And you know? he was asked about that either in a debate or in an interview straight up. Do you have any current business dealings? I think was something was similar exactly. to the word. And it was, there was no uh, misinterpretation of what the question being asked. And he's like, He's like, no, I don't have any. I don't know. Why would I? I don't. uh." (laughs) I mean, he just he just said straight up no. And then Michael Cohen, I think what you're saying, if I recall correctly, later on uh, corroborated that. Yeah, no, he was working on a deal while Trump was saying no, he was. Exactly. And and Michael Cohen, to his credit, admitted he lied earlier and then came clean. And he was working on it with Felix Sater. Felix Sater was the guy over there in Moscow trying to put this deal together. So, you know, you 
you, you take that information, take the fact that Paul Manafort all of a sudden joins the campaign, you know, in the summer of yeah. 2016, pro bono, right, for free. This guy who owns a ton of money already to Russian oligarchs is going to work for free for Trump. And then a day later, they changed the wording in the Republican platform to, like, go easy on Russia and, like, diss Ukraine, you know? And even if you didn't, you don't have to read into any of this. You just have to, like, I know there's a lot of uh, connecting the dots with certain things. And I don't love that when people like Rachel Maddow says, you know, watch this space and she's connecting dots. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Paul Manafort's last job before he ran Donald Trump's campaign. I'm talking about Steve Bannon's last job. I mean, I saw him the day he left his last job because we shared a fucking studio. But I mean, those dots and who those players were, you're talking about Felix Sater. How many more Russians were were around? Like, were they just always around? Did you know who was Russian? Not necessarily. I mean, as I said, my, you know, I only got around him at the after parties and the mm-hmm. tapings and stuff. So I wasn't yeah. in rush, you know, Trump Tower with him every day. I do know how many sort of poker dens that have existed in Russian brothels and stuff in Trump Tower for a long time. Poker. But, what do you mean? Pro- poker dens in brothels in Trump Tower. So there yes. were apartment. There were there were spaces in his towers that were rented that were just they were brothels. Yes, high end poker rooms. You know, you buy in and you go to the back room and sit around the table with a bunch of other gangsters. And there was brothels, straight up brothels. And you could buy other substances in the brothels besides, you know, relief. (laughs) <laughs> that, that was there. That was a known thing. If you were a finance bro in the 90s and you wanted to buy cocaine and play some high stakes poker, you know, and, and sleep with a prostitute, Trump Tower was your jam because you weren't going to get busted because Trump had Keith Schiller, ex NYPD sergeant. He had all these guys on the take. And what he was selling was like basically a service for white people to go do illegal stuff and not have to go up to Harlem to try and score it, not to saying Harlem is where drugs are sold, but you know what I'm saying? He's trying to like, you're safe here. You can do your thing here. It was the same thing as casinos in Atlantic city. You could buy, you know, you could buy whatever you wanted in the eighties in one of his casinos and you weren't going to get busted if you were the right kind of character. Do you know what I'm saying? Which is a white kind of finance bro ish type. Yeah. And the other thing that I heard you talk about was how he would also basically whoever those people were, he wanted them in his buildings so he could get something on them that he could use against them, which is, of course, the playbook, the Roy Cohn playbook. It's the Donald Trump playbook, maybe the Fred Trump, but some really dirty, crazy shit. I can't even believe that Trump's still alive with the shit he pulled and who he pulled it on and how much he's gotten away with. What did, what did a name, name something that he would do like that? Dude, the craziest story of that. And that's what he did. He, he would have compromise at these, like the Plaza when he owned the Plaza hotel, he'd invite a bunch of people to a party. So guys that were in charge of his building permits, people he had to do business with would get an invite and then they'd get in there and it'd be a party. Lots of models. This is when he had like Trump model management and was involved with look model of the year. So he'd have all these, you know, Eastern European, you know, models, quote unquote, they were models. They wanted to be models. They found out they might be doing something else when they got stateside and Trump put them in an apartment, you know, six deep and charged them 2000 bucks a month, which is what he did in his modeling organization. Right. But he would bring these women to these parties, invite his business associates and guys would get in trouble. You know, they'd go and they'd partake. And then he'd call them up on Monday and say, I got film on that. And I'll tell you one thing that when Trump built Trump Tower, right, there was a a concrete strike in New York City in the summer of 1982. The Teamsters weren't moving any concrete on the order of a guy named John Cody, who was the Teamsters official in charge of, you know, all the trucks that deliver concrete. Right. That guy was in business with Fat Tony Salerno and Paul Castellano, right, of the Gambino crime family that Trump was sort of auditioning to be a builder for. Okay, so there's a strike. You can't get concrete. The guy, John Cody, was under investigation for shaking down builders and saying, give me an apartment when the building's done and you can have your materials. Right. So he did the same thing to Trump. He basically said no concrete's flowing. Trump gave his girlfriend, John Cody's girlfriend, a penthouse apartment directly underneath the triplex that he saved for himself on the 48th floor. He tries to say 58th floor, but it's only 48 stories, right? 
He gives this mobster's girlfriend this, you know, apartment worth like five million dollars, even though she has no job, no visible means of income. And Trump himself signs off on the paperwork to help this chick, you know, this mobster's mall get a get get the apartment. Right. She takes possession of the apartment. Two weeks later, she gets a knock on the door and it's Trump guys. And they're like, we're here to put in the phone lines. And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm calling AT&T to put in the phone lines. Get the hell out of here. You know, and she shut the door and told John Cody. And he was like, never let any of Trump guys in the building you know, or in the apartment. So he was trying to bug the mob right after he gave them this free apartment. He's like, I'm going to be slick and go in there and put in my own phone line so I can eavesdrop, which is what he did at Mar-a-Lago, by the way. He had it. In his bedroom at Mar-a-Lago, he had a phone board so he could listen to anybody's phone call who was a guest. That's this stuff is all your 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 listeners can like. Look yeah, this it up. is no. I, I was going to ask you. This is but, all documented. Sometimes yes. it it can be confusing when it's Noel because he was so inside that company. But you're not saying really. Uh, you're not saying a lot. I feel like throughout your career that that you only saw most of it is pretty corroborated by others who saw similar things or you're actually getting this stuff from other sources yourself and didn't learn it when you're inside the the company around them. Right. Absolutely. And this everything I just mentioned, that story with John Cody, that's in a book by a guy named James Zirin, who did an exhaustive like, you know, research of the four thousand cases that Trump was involved in before he became president. Right. So before he ran for president, he was already involved in 4000 lawsuits, you know, going back to the DOJ suing him in the early 70s because he wouldn't let black people rent his apartments. Right. That's right. So James just breaks all this stuff down. And and I'm glad you said that, Pete, because anything I say, anything I say on Twitter, besides what's just obviously a personal opinion, can all be substantiated, you know, and and my point isn't even to like nail him on the specifics. It's to look at the pattern, you know, to look at like how much evidence do you need that this guy is not on the side of justice and democracy? You know, he is. Such a high criminal in so many ways, he's broken every type of of law, I think, and gotten away, including international law, all kinds of tax laws, obviously, but so much corruption. It's so hard to believe that he was president and that he's still out there. And I I, want to get your take because you're so you're also really great at watching and, and, and having takes on politics in general. And I wonder what you think of kind of what's happening as a result of Putin's war invasion into Ukraine and Trump and the Trump brand and the Republican Party, which has been supportive of Trump over the or of uh, Putin over the past four years, because Trump liked him. They like that type of person, authoritarian autocrat autocrat. I've talked with all kind of experts about it here on the show, but it seems like something dynamics are, are, are somewhat changing. And now that Putin is on the world stage and being villainized almost across the political spectrum, even a lot in the U S not completely. What do you, do you think any, any of the, the dynamics have changed in American politics or with Trump, his brand? You know, it's such an interesting question. I think Trump himself has become a bit deluded because his brand is become. now is what become deluded like now he's deluded yeah i think you know trump was exceptional at what he did five years ago because he was the only guy talking like that now they all talk like that right now you have ron DeSantis and marjorie taylor green and lauren bobert and stuff so trump has almost boxed himself into a corner that he's kind of like boring and old school maga you know so what i worry about is the more disciplined next guy you know the ron DeSantis, who happens to have a you know a, a navy jag degree and a yale you know degree and and is somewhat more disciplined but just as much like a psycho bent on power right so i think that dynamic has changed i think trump isn't going to have the same curb appeal and i think his own followers are kind of pissed at him because he it's sorry to say this, but he's almost moderate compared to how they are now. Right. Like, you know, you watch his like rallies and it's the same old crap he's been saying. But these guys have gone to like trucker rallies, JFK yeah. juniors coming yeah. back like they've gone full. 
bat shit. Well, crazy. a good example, a good example of what you're saying to illustrate that he's moderate was just on vaccines when he came out with a, in a couple of interviews. I'm thinking of the Bill O'Reilly one. And he's like, no, I think you should get vaccinated. Go ahead, get vaccinated. They started booing him. He's like, OK, it's like, you don't have to. I'm just saying you should maybe, you know, but that like the fact that he pr- like supported vaccination versus the type of people that you just I mean, there's entire convoys that they're anti-vax. That's the thing, much less. A few other weird anti-government, white nationalist, you know, uh, Jesus freaks. Right. Absolutely. You know, and it's a scary thing because sort of what Trump created, you know, Trump was a guy really he's good at branding and he was able to brand this kind of like ignorant, resentful kind of suburban white guy doesn't really get politics. But now politics is fun because politics is going to a truck rally and it's just like MAGA, you know, we yell at other people and, you know, He was good at like creating that brand, but now that brand is getting infused by so many other interests and it's taken on a life of its own that nobody can control. And the people who are trying to control it, you know, the Mike Flynn's and the Roger Stone's, you know, which might be Trump's biggest error might have been pardoning those guys. Now that I think about it, the guys who pardoned. Because they're going to steal it away from him, I think, ultimately. You know, I think ultimately, like, Trump won't be fascistic enough for Steve Bannon. You know, like, you can't trust these weasels, right? So sooner or later, they're going to be like, we don't need him anymore. Shiv him in the back. And I think, you know, as much as Trump is a loose cannon, he's also a 76-year-old guy, you know, who's who basically wants to, like, walk in a room. He wants music to play, and he wants to look at girls with big breasts, you know, and feel like the king. And I think the the craziness of this moment is going to leave him behind. And I also think tying himself to Putin so closely is going to box him into a corner. You know, I think you're making I really I hate to say this, but you make points I don't see other people making because who the hell are you? But I'm nobody. I'm I know, a- but you make really good points, which is why I'm talking to you. And it's like what well, you just said about. You know, one of the, the you can speak to this in many ways, but we all saw it. Hallmarks of Trump and Trumpism and I guess Roy Cohn was to just stab everybody. And I think a couple of the best examples to me, the best examples like Jeff Sessions, who, right. who was the first Republican senator to support Trump. Trump gives him a G and he has a two week ride before Trump destroys that man. And think about all the other people who he's hired, who he has destroyed them and their families. Ted Cruz. He just will destroy everybody. And I feel like what you're saying this the point that you're making is part of his brand is these guys are all going to turn on each other and stab each other. There's like no loyalty with even within their brand. And it used to be never speak ill will of Republican, that Reagan doctrine. But these guys might just start a circular firing squad at each other. A hundred percent. And look, he turned on Bill Barr the other day. You don't get a more loyal consigliere than Bill Barr. OK, he got you out of the you know investigation. Right. He shut down the Mueller investigation. He obfuscated for a month about the results. He got you out of a pinch, which, by the way, you mentioned Jeff Sessions. My theory on that was Sessions had Trump covered, too. I think Session picked Mueller because he knew that Mueller was an institutionalist who wasn't going to charge Trump while he was in office. And I think. Jeff had done him a solid and Trump was too stupid and hot headed to realize it. And he fired Jeff Sessions. You I think, think Sessions he- picked Mueller thinking that Mueller would somehow not prosecute Trump. He would do the investigation, but wouldn't follow through with. Correct. And I don't know that Sessions actually got to pick Mueller. I think Sessions actually got. Got, I think Mueller got picked after Sessions got fired because Sessions obviously got uh, fired. Right. So then because of the Comey thing. But my point is. I think Sessions would have continued to have Trump's back. I think that was an unnecessary firing that made Trump's life more difficult. But, you know, my point is Bill Barr, you know, so you, you, either yeah. way, he ends up with Bill Barr. Right. If you want to get out of trouble, Bill Barr got Elliot Abrams out of the massacre at El Mazote, which is where we killed an entire village of people in El Salvador with American bayonets, with American weapons. It was a war crime that we funded you know, that Reagan and Iran Contra guys sort of funded. And like, nobody really knows about that these days. But Bill- uh, Iran, he had, he did some shit with Iran Contra as well. Like he disgraced himself over and over the, by the way, what do you think of his point of saying basically in all these interviews, which none of them followed up with this question. And he needs to be asked this question based on his history. 
He's basically I would vote for Trump or any Republican over any Democrat because the greatest threat to America is the progressive movement is basically what he's saying. And we know based on his own religiosity and speeches at Notre Dame and so on, the the, the threat that he is talking about is the culture war stuff, uh, se- sexual orientation, women's reproductive uh, rights, equity. Uh, all of that, right? Like, isn't like, what do you think about what he means when he says the greatest threat isn't Trump? It's the progressive movement, which is also democracy. It's like democracy versus autocracy. How do they not say that to him? Right. I know. Well, you're, you you said it better than I can. And I don't know why they didn't follow up. I mean, we both know why it's a business and they're trying to sell books. Right. And William Morrow has got to make some money. So they have a contract. And and you're rightly I saw that you called out ABC and NBC for giving him so much free. Uh, that was really upsetting. Me, too. I was pissed because it's like everyone knows he's a criminal. Nobody wants to interview him. But. You make that excellent point. It's Opus Day, right? Opus Day. Yes. And like this conservative Catholic, which is also Larry Kudlow, my old neighbor in New York City, you know, which is also a lot of people, you know, in, in the government, in the U.S. government. So, yeah, progressivism is a greater threat, you know, than than our own dictator who, who's not paying attention to the rule of law and trying to usurp a, a free and fair election. That's crazy that he didn't get called on that. And you got to look at who Bill Barr is. He was a bully at Horace Mann when he was a kid. When he was at Columbia, he joined the cops to beat up the anti-Vietnam War protesters, the hippies. Yes, you know, that's right. A hard-ass little bastard his whole life. His dad was incredibly scandalized. And nobody talks about that either. That's a whole nother wormhole or whatever. But, you know, the guy is is he's the cover up king, you know, and, and, and you got to think mm. about that in terms of. Like what I said earlier, Roger Stone, Paul Manafort had a firm with another guy named Black. It was Manafort, yes. you know, yeah. Stone and Black. And they were basically lobbyists for 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 dictators. Right. You know, uh, for brutal, Marco, brutal you know. regime leaders in Africa and elsewhere. Exactly. You got money and you want to whitewash your image. Come to D.C. and we'll get you some favorable stuff. And right. it worked. Right. So. Yeah. You know, and Bill Barr's in that same ilk, in that same generation. These guys are really good at like, you know, bending the establishment to their will. Well, I've never heard him called the cover up king, but I can't think of a better name. Right. Before I let you go, let me just ask you. God, I love talking to you, too. Uh, and it's just so you're so easy on the eyes. It makes it, you know, <laughs> video chat uh, is. Does the. Does everything that's happening in Russia, and maybe I saw you talking about this, maybe I didn't, but if you know anything, if you have any thoughts on it, does everything that's happening in Russia, certainly with their economy and their and the the debt that they owe and own, does anything get laid bare with the Trump family's investments based on all of the sanctions and all of the the the, the, the issues with the economy? Are we going to learn anything more about them or do they stand to lose? They definitely stand to lose, you know, and Trump would openly launder money. He bought, you know, a piece of property in in Palm Beach for 13 million dollars a house. And then he sold it to a Russian oligarch for 68 million. And then that guy raised the house. Right. So a lot of those kind of deals were a lot of the bread and butter to keep their organization afloat. So I think they will lose a lot of their revenue. And I think a lot of more dirty laundry will come to light, right? Because at a certain point, these oligarchs are going to ask for their boats back, right? And their houses back. And we're going to have to say, well, prove it. Show me some paperwork and documentation that this money is legit. And it's really hard to believe that Trump's name the Trump organization's name isn't on a lot of those documents because we got Deutsche Bank. Yeah. We have all these other entities that are already on record as aiding the oligarchs through or in conjunction and concert with the Trump organization. So it's definitely interesting times. It's the end of their, you know, their ride of free, unlimited cash, you know, and it's the end of, you know, it's the end of something in the beginning of something else, Pete. And I don't think either of us know what it is, but I think we both know we've never lived through something like this. Yeah, before. that's for sure. Yeah. Do you do you see any I know you pay, again, close attention to the news, politics, legal issues, certainly surrounding this family. Do you see any justice being done to Donald Trump or anybody in his close circle, uh, his, his his daughter, his sons, uh, Jared Kushner? Do you see any legal case or any possibility? And do you also, you know, also, do you think that he runs again? 
I don't think he necessarily runs again. I think he flirts with it to grift money yeah, up until sure. the day. And I think he gets to pick his successor, so to speak, and gets a piece of the cake. You know, OK, I'll throw my weight behind you, DeSantis, but I get 15 percent of all the, you know, all the like, you know, donations until the election or something. I think ultimately that's what he does. Hmm. He's 76 years old. So in terms of the question of justice, I look at it from a dis- different perspective. You know, I have friends that he's assaulted. You know, I know women that it's not for me to tell their story, but girls that met him when they were 12 years old, taking ice skating lessons at his rink in Central Park that ended up in Jeffrey Epstein's townhouse on East 71st Street. And all they'll tell me is, Noel, you don't want to know what these men did to women in there. OK. And there's a lot of stories like that. You know, there's a lot of brave women that have come forward that yeah. haven't gotten justice. There's a lot more you haven't heard about. So for me, justice is a different term because I want to see him held accountable for that shit, which we all know he won't. In terms of the Department of Justice legal stuff, you know, obviously I'm a comedian. I'm not a law firm. But what I do know is like the symbol of justice is this lady with a scale and a sword, right? Mm -hmm. And it's about balancing it out. And as a comedian, you know, it's like, read the room. The room of the United States needs some justice right now. We need to see that somebody's taking action, like go up and punch them in the face because time is not on your side. You know, I get frustrated with the slow pace of justice and I know it takes a while, but time is not on your side. And the case in New York, the New York Manhattan, you know, D.A. is basically dropping the case. Right. And the grand jury that was impaneled is expiring this spring. So they're not going to bring new evidence in that case. You know, Weisselberg was never really going to flip because he knows how it works. If you're wealthy in this country, you can roll, you, you can run out the clock and you can make it so difficult you know, to bring a case. And then if you're somebody like Trump, who never used email and never signed anything, he's always one person removed. You right. know, do me a favor, like whatever it is. He never says exactly what it is. He knows he's, he's been around mobsters his whole life. So, you know, a long winded answer. I don't see the justice that people need to see coming. You know, it's like he's already gotten away with too much in my book. You know, no, I really appreciate talking to you, man. I love uh, I love following your stuff and your podcast, and uh, we should do a gig together. That's what I was Dude, thinking about. We should do a stand up gig. Would love it. It would be an honor. I will open for you anytime, any place. No, Peter I'll open you. for you. I'm an amazing opener. I'll bet you are, but I'm, I'm not, a great I'm opener. Not, I'm not worthy of you opening for me. That ain't. Well, happened. I'll do a date with you anytime you want. I would love to, but uh, you're in. I know you're in Philly in June at uh, City Winery, which is an awesome venue and i'll plug everything on the way out thank you so much for joining thank me man you, really appreciate it appreciate it thanks for having me Pete. be safe all right what'd you think noel kasler isn't that awesome wasn't that a great conversation i mean that was that was one of those conversations i was genuinely entertained and interested in like everything he was saying i mean i i, I always am with my guests but some are more academic you know you really got to prepare for and, and other guests are just kind of flying more about the seat of your pants and and that guy's just so good at talking i really really loved it what did you think please send me your feedback on who didn't like him put it that way i think we're going to be so overwhelmed with positive feedback on that conversation i'd be interested to, to hear somebody be critical of it and, and by all means bring it stand up with pete at, at gmail.com okay so my next guest I caught up with yesterday, and she's just so good to, to fit me in. She's always been really respectful of me and my time, and I've always tried to have her on as, as much as I can, as much as she's really available for. She's the author of Rock the Casbah and seven other books on the Mideast. She's a joint fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace and the Woodrow Wilson Center. She used to have a column at the Washington Post. And she, of course, is a staff writer at The New Yorker on Twitter at Right R, W-R-I-G-H-T-R. You see her on all the big TV shows and Meet the Press and Anderson Cooper and everything else this past week. And she was really kind to let me call her and press record. Ladies and gentlemen, lots to learn from and talk about with Robin Wright. Here we go. Hey, Pete. Hey, Robin. All right, I have her now. Everybody wants to talk to Robin Wright, and I'm very honored that she took my call. I know you have a million things going on. I really appreciate you, you know, fitting me in between Meet the Press and Anderson Cooper. How are you? 
I'm well, and I'm always happy to be with you, Pete. You're very kind, and I want to get right to the the issues at hand. There's so much that we can talk about, but of course, you've been writing a lot at The New Yorker and and talking a lot uh, uh, about all these issues, and so I just want to get to the the piece that you wrote at The New Yorker and talk about the importance of understanding how sanctions work. You've written this great piece, and I'm wondering if the past is not necessarily prologue here because this might be different. What do we need to know about how sanctions have worked in the past and how it might be different now? Well, after the use of military force, sanctions and economic punishment are the most popular tools to pressure a government, whether it's to stop repression, stop aggression, end development of a bomb, or prevent genocide. And this is a tool that dates back to the ancient Greeks, but has only become a popular tool by the United States since the end of World War II. We've used it increasingly to try to pressure other governments in a globalizing world where economies are interlinked. And we can use the squeeze, the economic squeeze, to pressure a government. The problem is that sanctions only work about 40 percent of the time. And we all know infamous cases where sanctions have not worked. When you look at Cuba, where the United States placed the first embargo in 1960 and has since added on layers of sanctions, and 62 years later, you still have a communist government in power in Havana. We remember the sanctions squeeze of Saddam Hussein in Iraq in the 1990s, first after he invaded Kuwait and later over issues which turned out not to be true, over right. weapons of mass destruction. Right. You know, a tragic failure by the United States. But sanctions, again, fail to get Saddam Hussein to collaborate or cooperate with the international community. And that led to two invasions, first to liberate Kuwait and then, secondly, to oust him. Uh, we've seen in North Korea where three generations of the Kim dynasty have failed to get North Korea to give up either its ballistic missile program or its nuclear weapons. So South Africa being the one success story right. where sanctions did have an impact, and yet the first sanctions were placed in 1962, and Nelson Mandela wasn't freed until 1990s. So sanctions uh, can work, but they always take much longer. And the bottom line is that time is of the essence in these conflicts. A bomb or a shell kills in a second, and sanctions can drag out for not just months, not just years, but decades. What about, though, that all of these private companies are literally pulling out or halting doing business or shuttering their doors if, uh, to, to Russia in this case? That's not sanctions. That's just they're not being forced to do that, right? I mean, these McDonald's and Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Google – Apple, is that something different and separate from economic sanctions enforced by, in this case, most of the rest of the world? It is, and it's inspiring. And I think Ukraine has produced, or Russia's invasion of Ukraine, has produced greater and more urgent action by both governments and private industry than at any time in the past. It's really stunning and it's hopeful, but we have to remember that these are largely Western companies and that there is a huge chunks of the world that have not imposed sanctions. And there are a wide variety of reasons. For example, the government in Brazil has been divided on sanctions and even voting uh, at the United Nations because Brazil, which is, is one of the world's largest exporters of agricultural goods, relies on Russia for manure. To, uh, for its crops. Hmm. Uh, in Africa, you have governments that are facing civil strife or civil wars that rely on Russia for weaponry, and they can't overnight abandon certain kinds of arms uh, and switch to Western systems if the West will even sell them those weapons. And, and India, again, this is a, a tremendously important uh, trade partner of Russia, it buys its weapon, a lot of its weapons from Russia. And, of course, India is a huge market. And then, of course, there's the biggest on Earth, and that's China. And China and Russia just recently signed an agreement that supported each other's foreign policies and economic development and so forth. So 
while what the West has done is noble and inspiring and extensive, that there are still huge chunks of the world that give Vladimir Putin an economic lifeline. You also wrote a piece, you wrote a piece about sanctions for The New Yorker, why sanctions too often fail. But you also wrote a part of the Daily Comment section at The New Yorker, a really important piece that a lot of people are talking about. And obviously the issue that everybody's talking about, what does Putin's nuclear saber rattling mean is the question that you answer in this piece. It's it, it's pretty t- terrifying to hear him talk about using these weapons. It's interesting to see the world's reaction, media's Reaction. By the way, I, you know what? What is media getting wrong about this? And more importantly, what does his nuclear saber rattling mean? Well, first of all, as background, you know, we thought the nuclear age was kind of over. That the benchmarks were the end of World War II and the uh, the end of the Cold War in 1989, mm. and that because of treaties, that there were there was kind of this general assumption that that there was mutual deterrence that. There were limits on the production and the deployment of all kinds of nuclear arms. The danger is that the nuclear issue is now suddenly back on the table because Vladimir Putin has talked about putting his forces on alert. Now, the question is, is this really an epic bluff because his troops aren't doing well and he's trying to psych the West? Um, The administration has responded very coolly. It's not taken the bait. It's tried to kind of diffuse the hysteria um, that was triggered initially when Vladimir Putin made these very strange kinds of threats in a meeting with his uh, top security officials, you know, at the end of one of his very long tables. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he doesn't even let his own his own security. It's people wild come. to see it. Yeah, it truly is. Um, the only time he lets anyone close to him are when they're the flight, the women flight attendants. Right. Oh, that's was, true. That's a good point. I didn't hear anybody, hear anybody make that point right. These young, attractive women. He's like seventy-five years old, and he surrounds himself. It was that was a weird optic, and shows how he still doesn't seem to understand. You're an old man, dude. What are you doing? That alone is weird. Well, he's only sixty-nine, but oh. um, yes, he's in that he's in that that phase of of his leadership after twenty-two years. Right. Um, but you know the 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 question. We can all hope this is just a bluff, but I have to tell you that in Washington, where I live, there is a lot of talk about how do we adapt our strategy because he has not acted rationally in many ways. I mean, he invaded a country when there was no provocation. There was no reason. The leader of the country wanted peaceful negotiations, was willing to have face-to-face talks, and Putin instead just dispatched 150,000 of his forces. And so we have to take into account what else might he do. And the problem is, and it's in context of a bigger question, Pete, and you're good on these subjects. The reality is that the, the nuclear order that has prevailed really for the last three decades since the end of the Cold War is today in chaos. Mm. That China, according to U.S. intelligence, intelligence, is determined to produce up to a thousand nuclear weapons by the year 2020, 2030, which is just eight years away. India and Pakistan are currently engaged in a nuclear arms race. We're all kind of watching to see if the nuclear deal with Iran can work or be revived to prevent Iran becoming the 10th right. country right. to get a nuclear weapon. And so what what's happened is that the, suddenly we find the nuclear bomb is back in the debate about how do you secure America and what are the future threats in light of Putin's language and in light of the fact that many of the treaties that were negotiated to limit the deployment, the production of nuclear weapons are now either either have been abandoned or they are losing their traction. And there's only one nuclear agreement still existent between the United States and um, and Russia. And remember, these are the two countries that account for 90 percent of the nuclear arms on Earth. And Russia has more than America does. Something is going to have to be done if we make it through this. You know, I was an expert on infectious disease and now I'm an expert on no fly zones. But I'll let you tell me what you think about this this debate that is happening right now over the reaction from U.S., the U.S., NATO, the European Union, its partners 
And if I don't know if you've got anything, I'm just seeing this story develop this morning about that. Apparently, we're not going to give them those Polish fighter jets. And I, I don't know if you have, have read into that or not. But wh- what do you make of this debate about the the reaction so far, including this no fly zone uh, suggestion, which does seem to, to be a declaration of war? So there are two different issues here, but they have to, a common thread, and that is, how does the United States do what it can to help the government of President Zelensky without crossing that very fine line of Russia believing that we are party to the conflict? And that right. plays out in the no-fly zone. To go in after the invasion and try to set it up is logistically a nightmare because you have to have forces on the ground. You can't just do it from afar, from the Polish border or another NATO ally. So this could have been set up beforehand, but the U.S. has never wanted to be party militarily to this conflict. We, The United States has been willing to provide all kinds of weaponry. And this goes to the second point of the MiGs. Uh, the Ukrainian Air Force needs more warplanes. It's Web, its airplanes are of Russian stock, old Soviet stock, and their pilots are trained on those on those warplanes. Poland has been willing to provide just over two dozen MiG-29, which are of Russian manufacture, right. to the Ukrainian military. The glitch came when the Poles said, we don't want to be the ones to hand in the Ukrainians because we don't want the Russians to think we're party to the conflict. Right. So we'll fly them to Germany to a U.S. base. And the United States is saying, whoa, don't do that because then the Russians will think we are party to the conflict. And where are those planes supposed to fly from? So the, the tragedy is everybody wants the Ukrainian Air Force to get access to these MiG-29s which could change the balance of power in the air, which is the most important dynamic, because Russia has the decisive edge at the moment. But how do you do it in a way that doesn't get either Poland or the United States perceived as a party? Uh, uh, and so this is a very fine line. And the vice president, Kamala Harris, has is en route to Poland right now to talk about this. I'm not sure she's the best qualified person, but presumably she has some Pentagon officials with her to talk about the logistics of this, some of the delicate diplomacy that's involved, and the perception. Vladimir Putin today has already called the ban imposed on oil purchases by President Biden an economic war. Mm. And we're, we're really in this incredibly fine line of how far do we go without getting sucked in to the war and in turn spawning a wider war than just one over Ukraine's future. The big question, the last question I'll ask you is about off ramps. I keep hearing that that word. I mean, I've heard it like I've taken in a lot of media over the last 48 hours, but that's a word I hear a lot. What are people talking about and are there any off ramps for Putin? Oh, don't we wish. I mean, it's very hard to see. The problem is that Putin is all in. Right. And it's very hard to see how he comes out of this. There's no redemption for him. The international community has condemned him. Uh, You look at the vote at the United Nations, over 140 countries voted for a resolution condemning in the General Assembly, not at the Security Council. So it has no teeth, but it is showing the will of the world. And question is, you know, does Putin just keep going? Does he double down militarily? Does he kill ever more civilians in the name of trying to seize Ukraine? I think we're all deeply worried about the what happens to President Zelensky, who is the face of the nation now and who has rallied the world. You know, there's not... Um, There's not someone who's well-known around the world as his replacement. Um, It's, you know, Putin has acted so irrationally that there are real dangers about how far he's willing to go. And to think that he may retreat and say, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I'm going to pull them all out just seems so unlikely. 
Robin, I can't thank you enough for your time today, and I, I appreciate your, your scholarship, your experience, your wisdom on all these issues, and I will keep reading you and following you and hopefully talk to you soon again. Any good news? Anything uh, that you want to mention? Any any shows or books you're reading? Any 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 joy? What, what joyful thing could we say at the end? April's around the corner, and then spring starts to bloom. Yes, I feel that, too. I feel that, too. I'm looking forward to that, and it's a really good way to end it. Robin, thank you so much. Thank you, Pete. All right, there she goes, Robin Wright, at Wright R on Twitter. Read her to at The New Yorker and get her books, and please let her know on Twitter that you heard her here on the show, at Wright R. I will be very grateful for anybody who tweets her and lets her know that you heard her. Okay, that was awesome. Noel Kasler was also awesome. I hope to see you tonight to talk about it all at The Hangout. Every Thursday at 8, if you're a subscriber, stand up with Pete.com. If you're not, and join us tonight. Awesome last week, and uh, always hard to top the week before. I hope to see so many of you there. I always love it. And uh, that's it. I'm out of time. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I think I've got Christian and Ophira, Michelangelo, Senior Rally, and who knows what else, but that is it for today. John Carroll taking us out right now. Uh, see you tomorrow. I'll talk to you tonight. Love you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep sitting tight. You got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. That's right. You got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eye. For a crystal ball Drawing all the plans of stand up But all they had to go on Was the time they were in With other causes for laws And since they weren't even sent They knew that change was gonna come Before the change could begin They had to stand up All right, they had to stand up We got to stand up We got to look the devil square in the eye Seat of that experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up. Show up. To the voice inside And listen well And it'll tell you Not to run and